I think that Lolita is very similar to myself. And not that we're going through the same circumstances, but that we both react in whatever way seems natural at the moment. I think I've always been attracted to characters that have enigma, that have many levels, that, that make the audience question whether they are good or bad, whether they're the white knight or the black devil. She's not a formed person, you know, emotionally or whatever. She, so her flirtation, whatever you like to call it, with Humbert um, means something quite different to her. It's all about experimenting with power and, and, and uh, seeing how much she can get him to do. Lolita, for me, has always been this sort of like boogeyman, almost like an elephant in the room. And, and it's just been a constant figure in the art that I've consumed as a child and into adulthood. I was really into Tumblr back in the day, and I say back in the day to make myself sound cool, but I, I actually still do frequent Tumblr. I was there in the early 2010s when you could not escape the Born to Die era on Tumblr.com. And on that album, there was a song on there called Lolita. I kind of knew that she was referencing the book and I had a vague idea of what the book was about, but I didn't like, I didn't know about it to the extent that I know about it now. And knowing what I know, I wonder if Lana knows the extent of the story. And if she does, I would just have a lot of questions as to why she chose to portray that relationship in the way that she did. Now, this isn't a Lana video, nor do I want to go back and forth with Lana Del Rey stands about the romanticization and glorification of abuse. I'm pretty sure you guys have, have heard it more times than, than you would like to, but when you have a song with lyrics such as Hey Lolita, hey, hey Lolita, hey, I know what the boys want, I'm not gonna play. And then it goes into, I could be yours, I could be yours tonight. And and w when you when we have that, and then you find out that the source material is uh, about a 12 year old being abused and sexually assaulted, people are gonna ask you questions. People are gonna ask you questions, Lana, because this isn't just one song. Your entire album is littered with references like this. The first lines of the pre-chorus of Off to the Races, which is a track on the record Born to Die, is Light of My Life, Fire of My Loins, which if you've read the book, you know are the opening lines of Lolita. There's also a song on there called Carmen, and that is also a nickname that Humbert gives to Dolores. There's also this Rolling Stone interview where Lana describes the album as a combination of quote, gangster Nancy Sinatra, let that sink in, and Lolita Lost in the Hood, which, which on its own doesn't make any sense. But the point that I'm trying to make is that even as a 12 year old listening to and reading all of this stuff, I was very, very confused. And since I just gave a whole spiel about Lana, you could also say that Lana was not making music intended for 12 year olds like me listening to it on Tumblr, and you would be completely correct. But in the same vein, adults, the would-be consumers or the would-be targeted audience of the music also have issues distinguishing what abuse is. And then you could also say it's not up to Lana to teach people about abuse, and you would also be correct. But if you are source material for this is exactly that abuse, the abuse of a kid, it is your responsibility to make sure that you are not inadvertently sending any messages that glorify this abuse okay and once again not to argue with the lana stands that is not what i want to do i was in the trenches with y'all when the whole question for the culture thing came up but at some point we need to be honest we just have to be if you take this story and you use it as sort of a launching pad for your album you're gonna have to understand the story and you're gonna have to read the book and if this is the interpretation that lana came up with after reading the book i I, I just I just don't know what 
to say because although I hadn't read it, I had an idea of what Lolita was. I knew at the heart of the story there was a young girl being abused. So the ways in which people chose to speak about her, I'm gonna say Dolores because one of the tactics of dehumanization in this story is not using her name, but the way that people have spoken about her and this book in general I'm bewildered like there's there's no better word in the English dictionary to describe how I feel if you could understand the rabbit hole that I've gone down in order to have a fully formed opinion on this and even then <laughs> that conclusion is questionable because I don't know if I have a fully formed opinion on this I've read the book the annotated version of the book. I've read the book that teaches teachers how to teach the book. I've read Nabokov's essay that he wrote in 1995 called On a Book Entitled Lolita that if we're being completely honest is more problematic than the interpretation interpretations of the book in my opinion. Um, I have also watched both films. I've read articles by Nabokovian scholars probably did not say that right. I've read the past works of Vladimir Nabokov and I've done this all in order to make sense of how in September of 1995 a book is released dealing with the abuse and sexual assault of a 12 year old girl and then in 2009 we have Katy Perry at her grown age calling Dolores innocent but also a sex kitten. And for some reason, I have this obsession with Lolita, and I think it's because she's both innocent and knows she's a little bit of a sex kitten as well, and she walks that line. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's boring if you're too goody two-shoes and you come out looking like a slut if you're a, if you're a bad girl all the time. <laughs> so you gotta walk that line. Mind you, once again, this kid is 12. Dolores is 12 in the story. So hopefully by the end of this video, I'm able to give a little bit of insight as to how did this happen? How did we go from a book about abuse to basically glorifying that abuse? Because there is no better way to put it than that. In the opening pages of the novel, we have a foreword from the psychologist John Ray Jr. and he quickly introduces us to the plot of the story. In those pages, Ray is framing the rest of the novel as a case study in abnormal psychology. In it, he lets us know that the story we're about to consume was written by a murderer and a pedophile who refers to himself in the manuscript as Humbert Humbert. Humbert wrote this manuscript while in prison, awaiting trial for murder, and not for the fact that he abused a 12-year-old girl, but I will pick that bone later. At the time of writing the foreword, Ray notes that the author has now died, and so has the girl he abused, Dolores Hayes, whom he refers to as Lolita. Humbert died of a heart attack while awaiting trial in prison, and Dolores died of childbirth on Christmas Day. Dolores Hayes' story begins before she was born, when Humbert meets his childhood love, Annabelle Lay, when he was 13 and she was 12, the same age that Dolores is when he meets her. Coincidence? I think not. Throughout the course of their entire relationship, Humbert and Annabelle are desperately trying to have sex, and I mean that literally. The way that it's described in the book is that they try on many different occasions, but something always ends up ruining the moment. But sadly, Annabelle dies before they can do the do, and it's implied. I don't even know if implied is the right word, but let's just say that the reader can infer that because of the trauma that Annabelle's death caused him, that image of her at 12 goes on to define Humbert's concept of the nymphette. Y'all, he spends pages and pages and pages just rambling on about what that term means and we'll get into some of the specifics a bit later on, but just for a little bit of background, the word does not appear in the English language prior to 1955, the publication year of the book. Nabokov completely made it up. And just a tidbit here, because I got curious about the word Lolita in and of itself, it's impossible to find the etymology of this word, so much so that in the beginning, I thought Nabokov invented it as well, but he only becomes significant, or his connotation of it only becomes significant to the English language meaning of the word. Turns out that Lolita has Spanish origins. It is the diminutive of Lola, which is a nickname for Dolores, because I was wondering why out of everything in the world you could call her, 
why Lolita? Turns out that it's kind of like a nickname for her name. It also must be noted that I'm not sure if Lola has always been a nickname for Dolores or if it became a nickname after the popularity of the book, but for this situation it's more of a chicken and egg. I went on that tangent because I was so fascinated by the fact that this random man, well he's not random, he had some some work put out there but nothing like significant, like this book kind of put him on the map, but I was fascinated by the the fact that this man literally just made up a word and everyone just went along with it. I know that William Shakespeare, that was his bag, but that was in the 1950s. We barely had words as it was. But the fact that people read Lolita and then the good folks at the Cambridge Dictionary came to define it as, or came to define Lolita as, quote, a young girl who has a very sexual appearance or behaves in a very sexual way. Yeah. Yeah, that's what that's what they define it as. When doing a general Google search of the word not attached to any particular dictionary, what comes up is a precociously seductive young girl, which in and of itself lacks the necessary context for understanding what this actually means. Because what is one's definition of a young girl? How are we classifying that? Because Humbert classified it as a girl from the age of 19 to 14. And to me, that's not a young girl, that's a child. He classifies nymphets as nine to 14 year old demon children whose main purpose in life is to seduce older men. So knowing that this is how he views Dolores, then to take the name he gives to her and to define it as sexually precocious makes no sense to me. As a young adult, Humbert completes his studies in Paris and London, where he received a literary education and began publishing articles in journals. Side note, this part of his history is suspiciously close to Vladimir Nabokov's actual life, which is why he often gets accused of pedophilia, but we'll get into that later. Humbert lives his life in this weird in-between while gaining access to child they're referred to or or the scholarship refers to them as these children as sex workers but i wouldn't say that i would probably refer to them as sex trafficking victims who are being exploited but he lives his life in this in between where he gains access to them to fulfill his fantasies while at the same time getting married to this woman named Valeria who he can only tolerate because she looks like a child. That is the only reason that this man is not repulsed by his wife. Long story short, and it really is a long story because if it's one thing Humbert can do, it's ramble for no good reason, but Valeria eventually leaves him for another man and he contemplates killing her for it. He then leaves for New York where he would spend the next couple of years going in and out of sanitariums. Now, armed with this information is where I said, okay, we need to pause because Nabokov never mentioned what specific mental illness Humbert was plagued with. And this is not me using mental health issues as a justification for anything he did to Dolores. Never that, quite the opposite actually. This is me saying that you can't trust anything that he says because this entire story is told from the point of view of an unstable person. And mind you, he's recounting this story from memory as he sits in jail and in the way and style it's written, He's basically trying to get the court to acquit him. He breaks the fourth wall all the time. Taking all of these different things into consideration, I just don't believe a word this man says. And this is a theory of mine enhanced by the fact that he makes it a point to say that he was able to successfully deceive all of his therapists for his benefit. So when I see certain interpretations of this book that try to make Dolores out to be the instigator of this relationship, for lack of a better word, and how she led him on, and how this 14-year-old girl seduced this 45-year-old man, I don't know if they realize that they're making these justifications on the basis of a character who is at best a narcissist and at worst a sociopath. And this is one of my main gripes with the movies. You don't get Humbert's backstory, and I think that that is critical when trying to understand this on a fundamental level. This isn't to say that we should never believe mentally ill people uh, when they say something or if you've been admitted somewhere to receive mental health treatment that you can no longer be a functioning person in society but if a man who doesn't have any of these issues tells me that a 14 year old seduced him I'm going to look at him crazy and in that same breath if a man who has been in and out of mental health facilities for years says that same thing 
that a 14 year old came onto them like it, whoop whoop it's the sound of the police like what do you mean I just think that a lot of the challenges we face today when it comes to the interpretation of this novel and Lolita in general is the mischaracterization that's done to Humbert on the screen. And he's mischaracterized in a popular light. He's still a terrible person, but they make him look infinitely better in the adaptations. Fast forward, he moves to New England and the family who he was meant to be staying with, their house burns down and he's referred to the neighbors down the street. Upon seeing the house, Humbert hates it. He thinks it's tacky and he wants to get out of there because Charlotte, Dolores' mother, keeps flirting with him. He's basically about to tell her that he doesn't plan on staying there, but before he can, he sees Dolores and instantly becomes infatuated with her because he feels like this 12-year-old nymphette is the reincarnation of Annabelle and allegedly, according to Humbert's thoughts, he basically falls in love with her. He keeps a diary and writes about Dolores, detailing all of his inappropriate thoughts. He even touches her inappropriately at some point without her knowing. And at this point, the book is starting to get progressively more and more uncomfortable. It has always been uncomfortable, but that discomfort was basically in the background, kind of looming, almost like a character in this book, you could say. And... As the story progresses, the discomfort becomes more, it, it goes more and more to the forefront. But what I would like to address specifically is the relationship that Dolores has with her mother and how that is painted. There is this dynamic that Humbert paints of Dolores and Charlotte that I picked up on and I haven't seen any other publication really address. It, it could be out there, but I haven't seen it. So I'm claiming this theory until I see it somewhere else. Um... But most of the discussions on this narrative kind of go along with what Humbert would like you to believe in that Charlotte did not like her daughter. I would go so far to say that he wants you to believe that Charlotte hates her daughter. Actually, it's not far at all. That's exactly what he wants you to believe. He wants you to believe that Charlotte is jealous of Dolores and Humbert. Mind you, Dolores is 12. Do I think it highly probable that a 12 year old preteen and her mother get into arguments all the time? Of course. Being 12 and arguing with your mom, that's a rite of passage, especially if your dad is dead and you are trying to deal with that. By the way, I have no idea what Dolores thought about her dad being dead because we really know nothing about her, but I digress. The way that this man tries to insinuate that this mother hated her child is abuser tactics 101. It's an isolation tactic and everybody just ate it up. Because of course, the 30 year old widow, not sure how old Charlotte was, but of course the old shrew will stop at nothing to get a man and that includes competing with her child. Of course, she was jealous of the youth that her daughter possessed. Another point on this, Humbert is writing this in jail hoping to get an acquittal. I don't know if everyone keeps forgetting that because once you have that context, it's easy to see how everyone else to him is the villain. He is the hero in this story. So that's the first point. And number two, he does not like old women. Actually, let me not say that. He does not like age appropriate women. Y'all saw how he was talking about his first wife. Why in the world would, would Charlotte be anything different? He already did not like Valeria, but his dislike, or I should say hatred, of Charlotte is way deeper because he views her as an obstacle to something that he wants, her daughter. But I do not think that she was jealous of Dolores as much as the movies and Humbert try to make it seem that way. There is also this scene whereby Dolores is going to summer camp and before she leaves, she runs up the stairs and kisses him on the mouth. Call me crazy, but I don't believe that happened either. He is on trial for killing somebody, not the abuse and kidnapping of this kid. And I'm assuming, not a lawyer, but I'm assuming that he wants to prove that the killing was justified. That's the conclusion that I've drawn after reading the novel. 
if I'm thinking like a narcissist slash sociopath, he would have to try to prove that Claire Quilty did something in order to warrant the killing, which he did. But we're getting ahead of ourselves <laughs> right now. But Humbert would have to prove that Dolores was better, better off with him. And how do you do that? You come up with a series of events that paint Dolores as the instigator, which he does throughout the course of this novel. And now we get into a whole other realm of unhinged. While Dolores is at camp, Humbert marries her mother because Charlotte wrote him a letter saying, I love you, so either marry me or leave because I can't live like this. Which, to be honest, I do think that that is something that Charlotte would do. <laughs> and while I am definitely ascribing characteristics to Nabokov's characters that he probably did not intend to be there, I do think that it was deeper than that for Charlotte. I think we have to remember that, like, while taking into account that this is all fictional but she is a woman in the 1950s and I have read what it is like to be or what it was like to be a woman in the 1950s and I, I do know that that life was not it was not and will never be for me so I do see how widowed Charlotte with a daughter sees this man come along who is a age appropriate for her um, who looks like he's intelligent who looks like he might have a little bit of money so I do see how like that would propel her feelings for him in a way but I digress he only married her because he does not want to lose access to Dolores after they get married they're at a lake and Charlotte says I want to send Dolores to boarding school and in response to this he thinks of drowning her he would also go on to drug her because one, he doesn't want to sleep with her, and two, he wants to practice the dosage that he would need in order to drug Dolores and sexually assault her. Need I remind you that in certain circles, this is seen as a romance. And I could say that I'm surprised, but I'm currently in the process of reading Haunting Adelaide for a video on dark romance on TikTok. And I 100% believe that the people who legitimately enjoy that book would also view Lolita as a romance. You cannot convince me otherwise because y'all lack critical thinking skills and I'm sorry if you feel offended but you need to take that up with a therapist and not me because y'all need help. Y'all need help and I hope and pray that you get it. So one day while Humbert is out getting more pills, Charlotte finds his diary where he's been writing these things about her daughter and she is obviously distraught, which side note, I'm deeply disturbed at how this was portrayed in the films where they made it seem as though Charlotte was more upset with Dolores than she was at Humbert. I'm pretty sure it wasn't like that in the book. I have to double check. But either way, Charlotte is so upset that she runs into the street and is hit by a car. Dead. And honestly, when Charlotte dies, the idea of Dolores kind of dies with her. I say that because after her death, I don't think the name Dolores is actually ever uttered when referring to the human being. Humbert goes on to be the only person that she's ever around and he only refers to her as Lolita. Humbert makes it so that he's Dolores' legal guardian by actually convincing people that he's her biological father and no one actually questions it. He then goes on to pick her up from camp, does not tell her that her mother is dead, then takes her to a motel drugs her the pills don't work as planned because she she wakes up in the middle of the night so he can't do what he wants to do but she falls asleep wakes up the next morning and then according to him she is the one who initiates the sex if y'all could see the look on my face right now he then actually goes on to justify this idea to the quote ladies and gentlemen of the jury by saying oh i wasn't her first because she'd already done it that summer at camp and if that was not bad enough they leave the motel that morning and Dolores is in pain and she says verbatim I should call the police and tell them that you hate me he then goes on to tell her that her mother is dead and she has nowhere else to go and that she is stuck with him and I I don't even I have no words and I really want to get on Stanley Kubrick's ass for just a second because it was despicable how he chose to portray this moment in the film. Adrian Lin too, but Stanley Kubrick was like, I, th I think his was worse. Um, 
Kubrick made no intention of the fact that Dolores even says that and from what I researched, there was this thing called the Hayes Code in the 1960s, whereby films created from 1934 to 1968, I believe, were prohibited from including uh, profanity, uh, violence, um, all of these different things. And okay, I get that. This story is hard to depict visually, and in addition to all of those constraints, I can see how it would have been a disastrous time even trying to create this movie. But what you don't get to do is change the intended meaning so drastically that the message is altered. In the way that the book is written, it's obvious that Lolita is a character. Lolita is not a person. The person is Dolores Hayes, and Lolita is all of the characteristics that Humbert imposes onto her. Lolita is who we think she is, right? In Stanley Kubrick's movie, her name is not Dolores. Her name is just Lolita. Her mom calls her Lolita. Her friends call her Lolita. Everyone calls her Lolita. It seems like an insignificant change, but it alters the entire meaning of the story because she then becomes Lolita. She becomes the perceived seductress. She becomes the sexually pro provocative person when she wasn't that in the first place. So certain things in order to like stick to the law, I understand, but there are certain changes that were made that just did not need to be made. In the books, it's Humbert telling Dolores that if he goes to prison, she'll be the one that's destitute and she'll go to an orphanage and all of these bad things are going to happen to her. But Stanley Kubrick decided to do a complete 180 because in his film, it's Dolores that is begging him to stay with her after she finds out that her mother is dead. Now, without all of the disturbing context of this, it would be easy to assume that she wants him to stay with her because one, her mother married him, so by all accounts, he's her stepfather and she calls him dad on like numerous occasions. And number two, he's the only person that she has, but with Stanley Kubrick and company's stated intent of turning Dolores into a sex object instead of the victim, it's impossible to look past that. They would then go on to spend the next two years on the road, staying in motels and visiting tourist attractions and throughout this time Dolores is getting more and more I don't know if rebellious is the right word but from Humbert's point of view she's less pliant and he's he isn't able to manipulate her as easily to the point where he starts paying her for sex remember what I referenced uh the child in in the beginning yeah yeah it, it turns it turns into that kind of situation so at this point they have to stop because the funds are running low and there's only so long that he can keep doing this so he gets a job at a local college and Dolores begins going to an all-girls school mind you at this time he's growing even more paranoid if you I didn't even think that was possible um first of all she's getting older and number two she has all this money saved so he's thinking she's plotting to leave him he doesn't want her to have any friends and god forbid she mentions boys the headmistress of her school has to personally go to Humbert and say while Dolores is a lovely girl she is acting out using profanity in class and cursing out all her teachers they basically tell him that he needs to give her some freedom and let her socialize and interact with people of the opposite gender very heteronormative at the time but either way because her development is lacking the least you could do is let her be a part of the school play she also says to him and i quote sexual maturing seems to be giving her trouble oh and just a tidbit while the headmistress is talking humbert thinks of marrying her so that he can strangle her do these seem like the thoughts of a sane person of someone you should believe and take seriously. Either way, she joins the school play and he gets even more controlling and paranoid and even more unhinged. He wants to know her every move and one thing leads to another. She tells him she's going to be somewhere. Turns out she was somewhere else and I'm pretty sure in the movie he slaps her. Not sure which movie, but it's most likely Adrian Lin. Um, and I'm just saying this due to all the censor censorship laws around Kubrick's. I can't remember if he hits her in the books, but it doesn't really matter because he is violent in every way possible. So around this time, she runs away on her bike, but Humbert finds her like 10 minutes later. And this time it's she who's insisting that they go on another road trip and she wants to plan it. And of course, Humbert says yes, because everything was just going so fine for him when they were on the road and he didn't have so many constant eyes on them. Now, the second leg of the trip has such a 
different tone from the first because while in the first, Humbert knows what he's doing is wrong, there's not this imminent sense of fear. And his fear in this part stems from the fact that he can no longer control Dolores like he used to. Previously, he was just afraid of the police finding them. But in the second trip, so to speak, he's afraid that Dolores might do something or tell someone or go to the police herself. As soon as they start traveling, Humbert notices that someone is following them and Dolores, bless her heart, is trying to keep his mind off that. Then Dolores gets sick and she has to be taken to a hospital. And this is the part where I'm always... I don't know because initially I thought she probably did something to make herself sick and that would give her the perfect opportunity to escape but then Humber got sick as well so I'm not sure about that but none of that matters because he left her in the hospital at night and by that morning she was gone. Humbert would then go on to look for her desperately never finds her and would have never found her if not for the letter she sent to him three years later. In this letter, she tells him that she is pregnant, married, and moving to Alaska, but she is broke <laughs> and she asks him if he could send her some money. He then hunts her down, fully intending to kill her husband, until he learns that it's not her husband who helped her escape, but that it was Claire Quilty. And this is where the book kind of lost me a bit because I had no idea who Claire Quilty was. And apparently they had some association in Ramsdale. Humbert had a really strange conversation at the Enchanted Huntress, the motel they went to after he picked uh, Dolores up from camp. And that is apparently supposed to be Claire Quilty because this person knew that Dolores was underage and what Humbert was planning to do. But we never see the guy's face or um, Humbert is so like nervous and paranoid in this moment that he tries to get the conversation over with as quickly as possible. Also, Quilty is the playwright of the play Dolores was involved in at Beardsley and that's how they met from what I understand. Anyway the timeline is a little bit wonky and blurry to me but I do not think that that is the defining moment. What is important here is that Quilty wasn't even trying to help her he was trying to get her to star in child corn but thankfully Dolores was able to get away from him. All in all, Humbert gives her the money, asks her to come away with him, and she says absolutely not. And to me, this was one of the most powerful scenes in the book because at the end of part one, he tells her that her mother is dead and Humbert can hear Dolores crying and he's not worried about her running away or anything because he says, and I quote, she had nowhere else to go. And if nothing else, that one phrase should key you in on what this story is and what it's about because as soon as Dolores had another option, she refused to stay with that man. The story ends with Humbert finding Quilty and killing him in a very gruesome and brutal way, if I can say so. And towards the end, Dolores says, he broke my heart, you merely broke my life as in referring to the differences and the similarities when it came to Quilty and Humbert. And that for me encapsulated this as a tragedy. <laughs> And thus, I fail to see, having given you the plot of this story, how anyone can look at it and go, that is romance and seduction. I just don't get it because it's not even hidden. It's not like you have to dig through the pages with a magnifying glass in order to find the abuse. It's literally right there. Him touching her without her consent, drugging her, hitting her. It's all there and I can't even put this on it being a product of its time that people were confused I can't even say okay it came out in 1990, 1955 and the rules surrounding consent and were different I can't even say that because the same shit that they were saying in 1955 y'all are saying now please allow me to bore you with theory for the next couple of minutes in 1956, a year after the publication of the novel, Nabokov published an essay called On a Book Entitled Lolita. The essay was basically a pushback on those who were trying to ascribe any moral value to what he had written. He states, and I quote, I am neither a reader nor a writer of didactic fiction, and despite John Ray's assertion, Lolita has no moral in tow. For me, a work of fiction exists only insofar as it affords me what I shall bluntly call aesthetic bliss. That is a sense of being, somehow, somewhere, connected with other states of being, where art is the norm. He goes on to state that, 
It is childish to study a work of fiction in order to gain information about a country or about a social class or about the author. In thinking of how to frame a response to this, I kept referring to this idea that I had for a video about the death of the author, cancel culture, and authorial intent. This thought was percolating for a really long time and I had pushed it to the back burner, but maybe it's time to bring it back. Because this, in not so many words, is what Nabokov was trying to get at, at least partly. From his perspective, we shouldn't view art outside the art itself. We shouldn't ascribe any characteristics to him or broader society via the interpretation of his work or any work for that matter. He believes that his art exists in a bubble and is not influenced by anything else but this aesthetic bliss, i.e. this sense of belonging that he keeps talking about. In 1964, Nabokov was interviewed by Playboy, yes, that Playboy, and it is nothing short of strange in my opinion. The first thing that really jarred me was the fact that he sounded exactly like Humbert. And you might say that yes, he wrote it, so of course he sounds like the character, but if you're someone familiar with the art of writing, you know that there is something called voice. That is, the way the character sounds, their traits, the, the different words that they use. And most of the time, authors try to develop a character voice that way. You won't view it as a self-insert. You won't view the character and the author as one in the same. The interview is pretty long and quite easy to find but there were two questions in particular and responses given that really caught my attention. The interviewer goes into some of Nabokov's work that feature Lolita because no Lolita was not his first attempt at broaching the subject matter. In 1939 Nabokov already wrote a novella entitled Bolshevik, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, about a habophile which is a grown-up who's attracted to uh, 11 to 14 year olds. It was first published in 1986 as The Enchanter in Ada or Ardor, also written by Nabokov. The main character loses his virginity to a prostitute when he was 12, and in The Gift, the main character meets a man who has spent the past decades wanting to write a novel that has the same plot as Lolita, but never found himself as being talented enough to do so. The interviewer goes on to say, quote, some critics, in poring over your works for clues to your personality, have pointed to this recurrent theme as evidence of an unwholesome preoccupation on your part with the subject of sexual attraction between pubescent girls and middle-aged men. Do you feel that there may be some truth to this charge? Now, this wasn't the first time that Nabokov was accused of being a Ever since the book was released, he's said and done things to make it clear that he wasn't one and those actions did the opposite of what he wanted them to do. For example, he mentions that he had no pubescent girls in his life, so he would go onto buses and stalk them and look at their bodies and a whole bunch of other shit where you're like, okay, this really doesn't help your case at all. Which brings me to the question of whether Nabokov was actively doing what he wrote about, and the jury is still out on that one. Some scholars think that he was, but it's more likely that he was a victim. But in response to the question, he basically said that people underestimate his imagination, and he himself never said anything to the effect of being abused. But the idea of this reality makes even more sense in understanding why he was so stringent on separating himself from the art that he created. The interviewer then presses him further on whether or not he thinks that the work is a contribution to society to which he responds, quote, a work of art has no importance whatever to society. It is only important to the individual and only the individual reader is important to me. I don't give a damn for the group, the community, the masses, and so forth. Although I do not care for the slogan, art for art's sake because unfortunately such promoters of it as for instance Oscar Wilde and various dainty poets were in reality rank moralists and didactics. There can be no question on what makes a work of fiction safe from larva and rust is not its social importance but its art. It's only art. 
Now, didactism is a topic that deserves a video all on its own, and maybe someday I will, but for today, didactism or didactic refers to literature that is meant to teach something. For example, by default, things like textbooks are or recipes are inherently didactic. Most, if not all, religious texts are didactic, and most nonfiction tends to follow this uh, trend as well. In the 1950s and into the 60s, there was a lot of tension with the concept of didactism. Formalists at the time held the position that the only value within a piece of art or text was the piece itself. Art should not be meant to teach you anything. I vehemently disagree, but this is what their position was is at the time, and based on Nabokov's statements, he believes that as well. And the question now is, can something be didactic without the author intending for it to be as such? And the answer is yes. To address the last part of his quote where he says that there can be no question that what makes a work of fiction safe from larve and rust is not its social importance but the art itself. Um, what he's trying to say is that what makes something withstand the test of time is that it's not tied to any societal or social significance. What he didn't take into consideration were two things mainly. Number one, we look to art to teach us about the past, right? When we read books from a certain time period or when we listen to music from the 80s, these are all things that help us either envision what it could have looked like or for the people who were around in that time, it takes them back. And secondly, barring technological advancements things haven't changed that much i've been reading franz fanon and he wrote the wretched of the earth in 1961 and every bit of it applies now sylvia plath the bell jar is is as significant as it was when she wrote it it's maybe even more significant right now because it really was the best of times and the worst of times we are living in those times right now Either way, everything that I just described is the central question in the death of the author versus authorial intent debate. When engaging with a piece of art or body of work, should we take into account the meaning that the author slash artist embedded into that piece, or is this work just a blank slate that the audience can impose their ideals onto? And can a piece of work or can art or can literature ever be penned in a bubble? Is it not influenced by the state of the world around the author at the time? Is the author really dead refers to the idea of consuming art without acknowledging the lived experiences and biases of the person who created it. In 2023, 2024, I do not think that we can do that. And maybe I'll get into the particulars when I make the actual video, if I if I make the video. But I think a lot of that has to do with uh, late stage capitalism. But on a human level, we know that people's lived experiences heavily influence their art. And sometimes you need an understanding or at least knowledge of that experience in order to fully engage with a piece. And if we want to keep it a buck, we live in a hyper per capital society whereby the only thing that really has a voice is the dollar and in supporting art you're also supporting the artist. The problem with Nabokov and his statements is that he wants to straddle the fence and have it both ways because let's ask Florence Sally Horner. Sally, as she was called, was an 11-year-old girl who was abducted by a serial child predator named Frank LaSalle in June of 1948. She was held captive for 21 months. According to Sarah Weinman's book, Nabokov was inspired to write Lolita from that story. He's always denied it, but he directly makes references to them in Lolita. So you can't on one hand say that literature has no moral or ethical value and then take inspiration from a real life situation that had tremendous moral and ethical failings. It does not work like that. On to aesthetic bliss. It took me some time to fully understand this theory because the way that Nabokov described it did not do much for me, but aesthetics in and of itself as a branch of philosophy focuses on the nature of beauty, art, and sensory perception. It explores how we interpret and appreciate things that are visually or audibly appealing and how those experiences can evoke emotions and a sense of harmony. Aesthetic bliss, from what I gather, refers to a state of profound satisfaction, pleasure, or joy that arises from experiencing or contemplating something aesthetically pleasing. Nabokov also stated that Lolita in particular is basically a love letter to the English language and 
therein we can ascribe the concept of aesthetic bliss to the way that the book is written and this is a major major problem for me the idea that we can forget that a 12 year old is being abused because Nabokov knows how to describe a sunset really well is so nasty. The fact that people can call the words beautiful and use it to justify the treatment of Dolores in the book is completely wild to me. And this is one of the reasons why the idea of the book is so warped. So Con, like just by coincidence I was on Twitter and I saw this thread of someone saying that people even reading Lolita was a bad thing and I am not here to state that people cannot write about uncomfortable things but when we can read about those uncomfortable things and not make reference to the actual content because the prose is so good I think that's why people take issue with this book in particular because this idea of aesthetic bliss has tra it's it's basically it's done what Nabokov intended like people are forgetting about the actual moral value of the text and they're focusing on how beautifully it was written which is why you have a lot of people not understanding the essence of the story if you are reading this text for the sake of enjoyment without acknowledging that you are enjoying a story that features the sexual assault of a child then it makes sense why we are where we are today at one point while reading this i thought nabokov would be turning in his grave about how twisted the interpretation of his work had become but it turns out that he never really cared about the subject matter of this book he just wanted to write pretty words on a page so it seems at least based on what i've gathered of him in preparation for this video i've watched what i would say a good chunk of the lolita videos available on this platform and outside of it but the thing is i don't agree with the ways that they characterize this story and the characters a lot of the videos and literature surrounding this topic talks about how dolores doesn't have a point of view um Everything we know about her, we learn through Humbert Humbert, and all of these scholarly articles talk about her being silenced and erased throughout the course of this story. And while that is true, it's only true to an extent. If you are watching this video without having read the book, you probably thought that Lolita was her government name because I did. There was no reason for me to think anything different and maybe it was just me, but from the moment that we're introduced to Dolores, albeit through the eyes of Humbert, I never stopped thinking about her. I never stopped thinking of Dolores Hayes as Dolores Hayes to the point where I had to train myself to not refer to her as Lolita, which was difficult because you're in Humbert's head for the entirety of the book. This is why it confounds me when people say that because of the beautiful way in which the book is written, you forget that Humbert is causing active harm to this kid for the entirety of the book there is nothing that went on in Humbert's head that didn't lead me to think about the implications that it had for Dolores you mean to tell me that Nabokov was such a good writer that he distracted you with beautiful and lush descriptions of all of these different things and impeccable com comedic timing because the book is brilliantly written but it's not so brilliantly written that you forget what Humbert was until Dolores told him point blank you what about after she said that I need to know because throughout this entire process I feel like I've lost my mind just a little bit is there ever a time when the aesthetic bliss is interrupted and you say hey a 12 year old is getting where is that interpretation or are we meant to ignore all of that in order to find the beauty in the writing because I did not Seven years after the novel's publication, the world would finally get a glimpse of what Lolita would look like and, spoiler, it wasn't anything like how she was described in the books. I like to call this section, Stanley Kubrick is going to hell. I don't even really believe in that place, but if it exists, um, they have a, a room with his name on it because it's where he belongs. The 1962 film poster for the first ever adaptation of Lolita completely and deliberately altered the way in which she was portrayed in the novel. Instead of the girl with quote gooseberry fuzz on her shin and someone who should 
wash her hair once in a while. Dolores from the novel was transformed into Lolita, this duplicitous sex object that was to be the villain in Stanley Kubrick's film because he did make her into a villain. Throughout the progression of the film, it's really easy to see that this depiction was one of the things that propelled the shift of Lolita's perception in pop culture. Ever since the publication of the novel, there were of course people that painted Dolores as this perpetrator, but it's not until Kubrick's film that this idea becomes interwoven into the fabric of society. One of the most, I don't even know how to describe it, but in the book, Humbert describes Dolores as a child. He describes her greasy hair, her smell after being outside, and basically all of the childlike things that he liked about her. But not once does he describe her in a sexual way that gives her adult-like attributes. That would go against the entire reason why he was attracted to her in the first place. He wanted her because she was a child, and those movies, those adaptations refuse to acknowledge that reality. There was this I think need to paint Humbert in a better light than he actually was. I don't know if this those films were meant to appeal to men in a way and they did this or they tried to do this by aging up the character of Lolita in order to make it look somewhat better. In this entire development Nabokov was kind of a mystery to me because he's on record as being, quote, opposed to any kind of representation of Lolita. It was one of the reasons why he was so adamant about not having any little girls on the cover of the book, which, like, no, no one actually took those words seriously or no one respected that. But he goes from this strong stance to praising the Kubrick film. He's quoted in that same Playboy article as describing the film as, quote, first rate. And he wrote the screenplay, and according to him, a preponderating portion of which was used by Kubrick. He had a hand in the production of this film. According to Ira Wells, from the moment the world first glimped the movie poster, quote, the merely textual Lolita had been lost to us forever. This new image of what it was meant to be an innocent 12-year-old was turned into what Katy Perry would then call a sex kid. The image on the movie posters was accompanied by the contentious question, how did they ever make a film of Lolita? Basically playing up on the controversy of it all. With reference to the discussion surrounding the casting and ultimate portrayal of the character, producer James Harris stated that, quote, we knew we must make her a sex object. She couldn't be childlike. If we make her a sex object, it's gonna work. This intentional change from the girl with long-toed, monkey-ish feet and thin, knobby wrists to Kubrick's presentation of Lolita as a sexualized adolescent Sue Lyon was 14 at the time, was distracted by the fact that society could not handle a pedophilic relationship on screen. Instead, the age discrepancy within this relationship had to be framed through the creation of a safer imaginary space established by the use of a seductive older girl. And the thing is, in neither movie do we get to know Dolores' actual age. We're basically just guessing. We're guessing on what she looks like. They never make reference to her age in any of the films. By doing this, and practically by all of the artistic choices that, that were made, the storyline shifted away from pedophilia and the suffering of Dolores in order to create a seemingly sympathetic understanding of one man's desire to be with a sexually attractive young woman. Instead of emphasizing the discomforting feeling that you got in the book of this man committing a crime against an innocent victim, Dolores appears throughout Kubrick's film in suggestive poses that a 12 year old should not be in. The objectification of Dolores paired with the first image or the first visual image of her character contributed to the new damaging portrayal of Lolita that pop culture has now come to embrace. Due to the strict censorship of the 1960s, so the Hayes Code that I mentioned previously, there's another aspect to popular culture's image of Lolita that is not completely encapsulated within Kubrick's conception of her. Lacking in his version of the character is the dimension of the, quote, sexually precocious young girl. This would later be introduced by Adrian Lin in the 1977 adaptation. 
Although Lynn's movie arguably follows the storyline a bit more closely than Kubrick's, I'm saying this very loosely, Dominique Swain, the actress cast for the role, was again 14 unlike the actual character and the thing is actors often play roles that they're too old for we had this whole debate on how damaging it is for actual teens to see people like zendaya or jacob alordi playing teenagers and how it warps their perception of themselves this is the same concept but even more sinister in my opinion because you're using an older actress to paint an abuser in a better light and then you could say gabby would you have rather a 12 year old play the role and to that i say wait until the end when I tell you how I would go about creating a movie of Alita. But for now, back to Dominique Swain. Despite having her first appear as a childlike figure, Dominique Swain's Lolita quickly takes on the role of a seductress and is portrayed as instigating the sexual relationship with Humbert. What's interesting about the two movies in particular is the different times in which they were made. Because of the Hayes Code, you have Kubrick's version as this dark comedy in many ways with fade to black being used to imply suggestive scenes, whereas in Leon's version, you have a 15-year-old Dominique Swain at the time kissing a 45-year-old Jeremy Irons. And if you know about Jeremy Irons, he should be kept as far away from 15-year-old girls as possible, allegedly. Let me say allegedly, Joe, yeah, before I... Anyways, throughout the film, the cinematography features close-ups of Swain's body, and she's often associated with phallic imagery that appears uh, sexually suggestive. Sexually suggest it isn't suggestive because in one scene she's literally sucking on a banana. For what? I don't know, because that was something that that wasn't even a thought in the book. But in the movie, Adrian Lynn thought it fit to have this girl sucking on a banana. I I don't know. The most enduring legacy of the 1955 publication and Kubrick's acclaimed film is the Lolita effect. The term was coined by Minaski G. Durham and describes the phenomenon in mass culture where pubescent girls are portrayed as hypersexualized objects of desire. From the promotion of child as Lolitas to the perversive images in fashion and pornography, Lolita as an exotic object of male desire has become a cultural icon. One of the social consequences of the novel is the permission it gives in literature for adult abusers to masquerade as powerless victims of powerful nymphets. This, this is not new at all. Predatory men have always blamed the victim but this is different because even the scholarship related to the novel engages in this behavior. The rule of abstract displacement has enabled most of the critics to silence Dolores just as much as Humbert does by refusing to take her seriously as a concrete person on the narrative level. This leads to Humbert's self-confessed crimes of kidnapping and being cast as expressions of the quote really genuine and selfless love he has for her these are literally words from stanley kubrick's mouth he's going to hell one prime example of the lolita effect and one that i have a particular attachment to is pretty little liars basic rundown the show followed the lives of high school teens who often found themselves in relationships with grown adult men i already have a video on pll but we could make a separate one detailing all of the inappropriate relationships on that show and it would give me hours and hours of content at least three out of five of them so spencer allison and aria have had relationships with adults Wait, actually Hannah too, because she had that thing with Bren. So 80% of the friend group was preyed upon by a man. And the show writers had us as kids thinking that this was normal. I don't even really have to get into Arya and uh, Ezra Fitzgerald. Fitz needs an entire SVU season dedicated to him alone. Or how they try to make us think that Spencer was out to steal her sister's boyfriend. And not why these men wanted to date teenagers in the first place. But... PLL in particular has direct allusions to Lolita through Allison's obsession with the book. She also had Vivian Darkbloom as an alter ego, which is not only an anagram for Vladimir Nabokov, but a character who makes cameo appearances in a few of his works. Whereas 
many of the other actresses in the show are years older than the characters they portray. Sasha was only 14 years old when she first started playing the then 16 year old Allison. Mind you, she was acting circles around the other girls, but I digress. That's that's also a conversation for another day. The combination of the sexualization of her younger features above all the other characters in the show combined with direct allusions to Nabokov all seem to play off the allure of the Lolita effect. And now for my final trick, we get to talk about one of my favorite things, advertising. And what do we see in a lot of advertising? The objectification and sexualization of teen girls. These campaigns mostly feature white women above the age of consent wearing certain outfits while placed in environments typically associated with preteens. I tend to put emphasis on the white and this is something that I don't see a lot of other scholarship mention. The idea of the Lolita effect or a Lolita is only really used when referring to white women. Why is that? This is my theory and once again I haven't seen it anywhere. It could very well exist. It most likely exists because we have way too many brilliant um, black women scholars for it not to, but I haven't found it. The idea of Lolita is underscored by this perceived innocence, as in the child in question only pretends to be innocent when it comes to things of a sexual nature, but actually it's only a game and they know that they are more flirty and they know more than they let on. Black girls don't get to be innocent. Black girls don't get to experience girlhood, so they don't have an imagined innocence to fall back on. Not that that's better, but I can't help but notice the differences. One of the most famous advertising campaigns that perpetuates this imagined innocence is a Calvin Klein jeans campaign released in 1980, which features a young Brooke Shields. The actress is depicted in positions that were regarded as sexually provocative at the time and led to controversy since Brooke had become famous two years prior for her role as a child prostitute in the film Pretty Baby. In the decades following this campaign, this type of child sexualization would become increasingly prevalent, i.e. Britney Spears on the cover of a 1999 Rolling Stone issue in lingerie in a child's bedroom, and Russian supermodel Natalia Vodianova being featured in Vogue Japan holding a teddy bear between her thighs. We also have Kate Moss with her feature spread in Italian Vogue in 1992 entitled Charming Lolita, which depicts her as another version of Kubrick's Lolita with shoulder length curls and red sunglasses. In 2011, Marc Jacobs had a campaign for his new fragrance, Olola. Jacobs justified his choice of then 17 year old Dakota Fanning as the poster girl by stating that she was quote, a contemporary Lolita, describing the perfume itself as quote, more of a Lolita than a Lola. The campaign was subsequently banned in multiple countries due to the fact that Dakota looked younger than 17, most likely intentionally, as well as the placement of the perfume bottle between her thighs. Everybody's just placing everything between teenagers' thighs, it seems. These types of advertising campaigns and media depictions of Lolita have reduced Dolores from an emotionally complex character to nothing more than a body with hypersexualized physical traits. In the novel, Humbert Humbert considers personality an important factor in determining a girl's nymphette potential. Quote, what drives me insane is the twofold nature of this nymphette, of every nymphette. Perhaps this mixture in my Lolita of tender, dreamy childishness and a kind of eerie vulgarity stemming from the snub-nosed cuteness of ads and magazine pictures. What's really interesting in these commercial campaigns is that they have always chosen to focus on Lolita as opposed to Humbert, the narrator and arguably the protagonist of this novel and this deliberate omission brings to light the contradiction between the audience's willingness to vilify Humbert's pedophilic activities while simultaneously indulging in and perpetuating them. So I fully intended for this to just be a one part video. I had no intentions of filming another part but after editing, I realized that there are a lot of things that I actually want to say on this topic that goes a little bit deeper, but also makes connections to a lot of different things. So I'm going to close it off here because I think it's a perfect time to stop. I don't want it to be too long, but this is part one and part two will be coming shortly. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you in the next one. Bye.